Timekeeping is all about the measurement of motion. And as history unfolds, everything from galaxies and planets to atoms and electrons are in constant motion. Thus, by observing the motion of certain objects and comparing their movements to the motion of the Earth, the Sun, and the Moon, both ancient and modern cultures have always tracked the passage of time. So while we mean no offense to those who think differently, to have a meaningful and intelligent discussion about timekeeping, we need to understand and accept the heliocentric or sun-centered model of our solar system. This is because the measurement of time we know as a day is based on the Earth's rotation on its axis relative to the sun. And the measurement of time we know as a year is based on the time it takes for the Earth to orbit the sun. Plus, we need to accept that a simple international phone call can conclusively prove that when it's 11 a.m. and the sun is out here in Weatherford, Texas, it's 11 p.m. and the sun is missing in Hoved, Mongolia. Also, a much less expensive long-distance phone call can prove when the sun is setting in Weatherford, Texas tonight at 5.32 p.m. Central Time, the sun will have already set almost exactly one hour earlier in Atlanta, Georgia. You see, the 24 distinct time zones of the world that follow curved longitudinal lines that follow the spherical shape of the Earth, along with their unique sunset and sunrise times, and even the phenomenon of jet lag, all conclusively demonstrate that we live on a spherical planet that rotates on its axis while the moon orbits our planet and we orbit the sun. Plus, common sense dictates that any powerful light source like the sun located above a flat plane must be visible to everyone on that plane all at once. But only a sphere can account for the time zones we experience on Earth. So, with these basic facts understood, we'll begin by saying today the Gregorian calendar date is Saturday, November the 12th, 2022 AD. Now, I should also mention that the Gregorian calendar most of the Western world uses today was established by the man known as Pope Gregory the 13th and it took effect in most Roman Catholic nations and states in the year 1582 AD however prior to Pope Gregory's calendar that corrected an error in leap year calculations the predominant method of tracking days months and years was the Julian calendar and this system of timekeeping was instituted under Julius Caesar in 46 BC. But according to the Julian calendar, today would actually be 13 days earlier than it is on the Gregorian calendar. Now, the difference between the two dates stems from the fact that the Julian calendar loses one whole day every 128 years compared to an actual solar year which is simply the measurement of time needed for the earth to complete one full orbit around the sun so the gregorian calendar was created to eliminate that issue and it only loses one day every 3300 years Meanwhile, the reason we have a 24-hour day is because it takes 23 hours and 56 minutes for the Earth to rotate on its axis one time. But as the Earth rotates on its axis, it also advances along its orbit around the Sun. 
Therefore, the Earth's orbital movement, combined with the time it takes for the Earth to rotate once on its axis, means that every 24 hours, any given earthly time zone's position to the Sun resets. Plus, we should also note that the Gregorian and Julian calendars both reckon the beginning of a day to be midnight, even though that's roughly the middle of the night, and noon is roughly the middle of the day. And that's why the Western world advances each day of the week, each month, and each year at midnight. But this was not always how people told time. Many other cultures throughout history have considered the day to begin at either sunrise or sunset. But one final thing to note about the Gregorian and Julian calendars is that they are both solar calendars. And this means that they are exclusively governed by the relationship the Earth has with the Sun, without relying on the Moon in any way. However, other types of calendars exist. For example, the lunar calendar, the lunar solar calendar, and the lunar solar agricultural calendar. Now, a lunar calendar relies exclusively on the waxing and waning cycles of the moon, and it does not take into account at all the Earth's orbit around the sun. But a lunar solar calendar relies first on the cycles of the moon to track months. Plus it also adds a leap month every few years to bring the calendar back into alignment with the Earth's rotation around the sun. Meanwhile, a lunar solar agricultural calendar does everything a lunar solar calendar does, but it adds an agricultural element such as a spring crop's readiness, to verify seasonal alignment with the solar calendar. And we must note, God mentions that he made both the sun and the moon to regulate time. And God named the first month of the year after the ripeness of the barley crop, which is harvested in and near Jerusalem, in the spring. Also, we should note that most scholars would say we have a 24 hour long day because of the Egyptians and the ancient sundials the Egyptians made. You see, the Egyptian sundial divided the daylight portion of the day into 12 hours and the nighttime portion of the day into 12 hours. However, as the seasons changed, the length of an Egyptian hour would also change. Thankfully, a 2nd century AD Greek man named Hipparchus proposed fixing the length of the hour after he calculated that the spring and autumn equinoxes both had 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness. So the hours of the day during the spring and fall equinox events provided Hipparchus a way to create hours that always lasted for 60 minutes. Thus, all of these facts led our Lord to say, Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. So Jesus agreed that there are 12 hours of daylight on average, but would Jesus and his apostles ever use the Julian calendar or the Gregorian calendar that most of the world uses today? Well, to answer that important question, we need to learn where the days and the months of those Roman-based calendars got their names. The name January is derived from the ancient Roman month of Januarius, which was named in honor of the mnemonic Roman pseudo-god Janus. The name February 
is derived from the ancient Roman month of Februarius, which is named in honor of the pagan Roman festival of purification. The name March is derived from the ancient Roman month of Martius, which was named in honor of the demonic Roman pseudo-god Mars. The name April is derived from the ancient Roman month of Aprilis, which was named after the Latin verb aperio, that means to open. The name May is derived from the ancient Roman month of Maius, which was named in honor of the demonic Greek pseudo-goddess Maia. The name June is derived from the ancient Roman month of Junius, which was named in honor of the demonic Roman pseudo-goddess Juno. The name July is derived from the ancient Roman month of Julius, which was named in honor of the supposedly deified pagan Roman emperor Julius Caesar. The name August is derived from the ancient Roman month of Augustus, which was named in honor of the supposedly deified pagan Roman emperor Augustus Caesar. And the remaining month names, September, October, November, and December, are based on the earlier and more ancient system of simply referring to months by a number. The prefix sept means seven, oct means eight, nov means nine, and dec means ten. These prefixes originally fell on their appropriate months until pagan calendar reforms caused January and February to be inserted before them. So now that we understand the pagan names behind the months of the modern calendar, we can learn the pagan reasons secular society calls the days of the week Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. The name Sunday was created to honor the sun because the Romans, along with many other pagan cultures, considered the sun to be a god. The name Monday was created to honor the moon because the Romans, along with many other pagan cultures, considered the moon to be a god. The name Tuesday can ultimately be traced back to the demonic Roman pseudo-god of war named Mars because the Germanic pseudo-god most closely associated with Mars was named Tu. So Tuesday comes from the name of the demonic pagan pseudo-god Tu. The name Wednesday can ultimately be traced back to the demonic Roman pseudo-god named Mercury, because the Germanic pseudo-god most closely associated with Mercury was named Woden. So Wednesday comes from the name of the demonic pagan pseudo-god Woden. Now the name Thursday can ultimately be traced back to the demonic Roman pseudo-god Jupiter, because the Germanic pseudo-god most closely associated with Jupiter was named Thor. So Thursday comes from the name of the demonic pagan pseudo-god Thor. The name Friday can ultimately be traced back to the demonic Roman pseudo-goddess Venus, because the Germanic pseudo-goddess most closely associated with Venus was named Frigg or Freya. So Friday comes from the name of the demonic pagan pseudo-goddess Frigg or Freya. And the name Saturday was created to honor the planet and demonic Roman pseudo-god Saturn, because the Romans, along with many other pagan cultures, considered the planets like Saturn, Venus, Jupiter, Mercury, and Mars to be gods. Meanwhile, the one true God has said, In all that I have said to you, be circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods, 
nor let it be heard from your mouth. And David later replied, Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another god. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. So the truth is, Jesus would not use the Julian or the Gregorian calendar to track time, especially since our Lord already instructed us on how we should keep time in the Holy Scriptures. The fact is, God did not say, January shall be the beginning of months to you. God said the month whenever Passover was celebrated was to be the first month of the year for his people. Scripture tells us, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Then God added, And they shall take some of the blood, and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Plus God explained, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Then the Lord went on to say, On the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which every one must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at evening, you shall 
eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the first month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bread. So later Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. On this day you are going out in the month of Abib. So, the first month of the biblical year always includes Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. And the Bible refers to the first month of the year with the word Abib, which means tender, green, or young, as in the month of young ears of grain. Also, this term is specifically used in reference to the barley, which was to have ripening heads of grain that were almost ready for harvest when the year began. Now, the reason the barley had to be almost ready for harvest was because God also told them, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you and reap that land's harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And God also said, And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count fifty days until the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread coincided every year with the beginning of the barley harvest, and the first month of a new year only begins when the grain is about two weeks away from being ready to harvest and a new moon is spotted. If the grain was not going to be ready to harvest by the time first fruits offering was to be made, an extra month was added to the calendar, and in this way the barley crop and ultimately the rotation of the earth around the sun caused an extra thirteenth month to be added once every two or three years. Also, since months in the Bible are determined by the sighting of the new moon, and because a new moon in conjunction or complete darkness cannot be seen with the naked eye, sighted new moons are based on the first view of a sliver moon. Additionally, days in the Bible are reckoned from sunset to sunset. And we know this because God said about the Day of Atonement, It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening to evening you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Therefore, all of this means that the Bible teaches a lunar-solar agricultural calendar with evening-to-evening -evening days and seven-day weeks. Most years have 12 months, but every two or three years, an extra 13th month must be added in when the spring barley crop would not yet be ready with young ripening ears known as a beeb grain. Eventually, a mathematical pattern between the solar and lunar cycles was discovered by an Athenian astronomer named Meton, 
And this metonic cycle provided a way to accurately predict when a leap month would have to be added in the spring to the calendar to maintain an accurate agricultural alignment. Meaton discovered that every 19 years, the phases of the moon fell on the same days on the solar calendar, and he established a pattern to divide up this 19-year period with lunar leap months added in the spring on the 3rd, 6th, 8th, 11th, 14th, 17th, and 19th years. This means we can accurately predict 2024 will require a leap month to be added in the spring to remain aligned with the agricultural and solar calendar, along with 2027, 2030, 2033, and 2035. Meanwhile, since every 29.53 days the lunar cycle resets, every 29 days all those who keep the biblical calendar look to the night sky to spot the new sliver moon at sunset. And when they spot that new moon, it indicates a new month has begun. This is how Jesus and his apostles kept time in the Bible. And while they might use secular events, such as the year of a well-known leader's reign or a census, to refer to a particular time, they would not use the names of false gods or the Gregorian sun-worship-based calendar. Truly, by creating this lunar-solar agricultural calendar, our Creator was insulating His people from some dangerous temptations to worship the sun, the moon, or even their crops. Because God calls us to look to three different measurements of time, along with all of his holy Sabbaths, to know what time of the year it really is. So God referred to the first month as Abib in Exodus 23, because Abib describes the readiness of the barley crop. But after the times of pagan captivity, the children of Israel began to call this very same month Nisan. So we must recognize, in the Bible, there's a very big difference between prescription and description. Thankfully, no one looks at the biblical description of the sinful actions of Lot's daughters and treats that description like a prescription. And thankfully, no one follows the bad example of Jephthah and his poorly thought out vow. So why would we assume that a biblical mention of a new month name or a new non-prescribed feast should be treated the same as direct prescriptions from Almighty God? The fact is God called the first month on his calendar Abib, and God never called it Nisan. Also, God directly and clearly prescribed that we never speak the name of any foreign gods. But many misguided people all around the world ignore passages like Exodus 23.13, and they call the fourth month of the year Tammuz. But this is the name of a pagan pseudo-deity who is soundly condemned in Ezekiel 8.14. Thus many people who keep the Sabbath and the feasts of the Lord have adopted the custom of using the traditional month names the Israelites picked up during their time in Babylonian captivity. But those pagan month names were never prescribed by our Creator. They include the names of pagan pseudo-gods, and since we're no longer in any sort of Babylonian captivity, we should drop all such pagan influences. So while God called the first month Abib in reference to the ripeness of the barley grain, the Babylonian captivity has led many to rename that month Nisan, and that man-made tradition has taken hold. 
But that particular replacing of God's instructions with Babylonian tradition played a role in how many Jews now claim their new year begins in the fall instead of the spring as God instructed. You see, minor modifications and deviations from God's instructions, well, that typically leads to many more serious transgressions. So please remember, God only named four months of the year. Habib, Ziv, Ethanim, and Bul. And he typically referred to them numerically. So we should be very careful to observe what our God has commanded and demonstrated while avoiding all traditions and customs that originate in the world instead of the Bible. And now that we understand the secular Gregorian calendar and the Babylonian-influenced Hebraic calendar that is so often confused with the biblical calendar, we can now see the true biblical calendar is very different and it begins in the spring. But now that we understand the basics of how the biblical calendar works, next we have to consider how can we implement the biblical calendar in this modern world we live in. When speaking to others who understand the pagan origins of the names of the week, we can refer to the days of the week as day one, Day 2, Day 3, Day 4, Day 5, Day 6, and Day 7, or the Sabbath day. But when speaking to non-believers or those who don't yet know what we have learned, it may be necessary to use the traditional secular names of the days of the week. Similarly, we can refer to the months of the year on the biblical calendar by number or we can use the names God gave us for those four months he actually named. But when speaking of time on traditional secular calendars, frankly, it's often necessary to use the traditional secular month names, especially since biblical months don't directly correspond to secular months, and their alignment shifts a bit each and every year. Essentially, until Jesus returns. We often have to translate biblical dates into secular dates to communicate with the secular world. But one day in the future, we will be able to fully abandon the filthy pagan names the pagans have applied to their calendar and forget them entirely. In the meantime, like the Israelites of the first century who were under Roman rule, we are still trapped in a Roman-influenced world, and we sometimes must use Roman dates to communicate with others. For now, this reminds us that the calendar we have been learning about was given to the Israelites after they were freed from slavery in Egypt. And it was based on them becoming completely independent landowners in their very own promised land. They were set free from Egypt's pagan calendar, just as they were later set free from Babylon's pagan calendar. And we will one day be set free from Rome's pagan calendar. But until then, Reluctantly, we sometimes have to transition back and forth between calendars, looking forward to the day Jesus sets us free from every Roman and pagan influence. Meanwhile, the Lord's throne is not yet on earth, and we are not yet all independent landowners under a biblical government, nor are we free to watch for a new moon every 29 days or so and declare a holy day of absolute rest that day or two weeks later. Instead, most of us have to provide our employers advanced notice of our requested days off months ahead, and that requires we use some modern scientific calculations 
and apply those calculations to the biblical calendar to announce the annual feast days long before we actually cite their corresponding new moons. This isn't exactly what scripture describes, but it prevents leaving people behind who really need to provide some form of advance notice to their employers to celebrate the feasts of the Lord. And at this time in history, we can do this without ever really getting off in our timekeeping in any meaningful way. This is because it's now possible to predict the biblical calendar in advance by mathematically forecasting the exact phase of the moon's illumination at any time, in any time zone, regardless of weather. Therefore, by testing and determining that the minimum visible illumination of a new sliver moon would be 2% illumination, and by calculating sunset times for 29 and a half days after the previous full moon, we can identify when any future new moon can be spotted by the typical observer. Also, since each new moon sighting is independent of the previous month, if we're one day later or one day earlier than another congregation, as long as our methods are the same, we will realign with them in the second month of the year. In fact, the only time we could ever end up out of alignment with God's calendar by more than a single day would be when we have to declare leap months in advance. But the metonic cycle helps us eliminate that problem. Meanwhile, all of these details help us understand the type of situation Paul had in mind when he wrote to the Colossians about these matters, because he said, Then do not let anyone judge you in eating or in drinking, or in part of a feast, or of a new moon, or of Sabbaths which are a shadow of coming things, but the body is of Christ. Paul gave us a list of things we are not to let anyone judge us on, and that list includes eating, drinking, or part of a feast, new moon, or Sabbath. Now, we all still eat and drink, so because Paul included eating and drinking in this list, it's evident that Paul expected the church in Colossae to be observing the feasts, new moons, and Sabbaths too. Obviously, if they were not to let anyone judge them regarding a particular of how they did these things, they must have still been doing them. So if anyone ever tries to tell you that this verse means you should not celebrate the feasts, new moons, or Sabbaths of your God, you can explain to them, Clearly, this is not a list of things we don't practice. It's a list of things we do practice. And we are not to allow others to judge us on any part or particular of how we keep the feasts, new moons, and Sabbaths of our God. But we will keep them. And now that we understand the complexity of the biblical calendar and why some people might judge others on how they spotted or calculated the new moon or how they used the metonic cycle to decide when a leap month is needed, well, we can see why this verse was written. God wants his people to make the focal point of his feasts, his new moons, and his Sabbaths Worshipping him with our brothers and sisters in the Lord in unity, love, and harmony. Not arguing with other saints over details like barley ripeness, metonic cycles, or phases of the moon. If we strain at the gnats of the biblical calendar, we can sometimes miss the camels of love, mercy, and peace. So, while we desperately want to be as accurate as possible, and we will strive for that goal as a group every year, our primary goal is to be united with our brothers and sisters and our Lord in joy, love, and peace as we celebrate the salvation we have found in our victorious Messiah. Now, with 
all that we've learned in mind, our next calculated new moon sighting of minimum illumination is November the 25th at 5.26 p.m. at 5.5% illumination. This is because the moon's calculated illumination at sunset on November the 24th will only be 1.35%. Meanwhile, through years of testing, we have found this low level of illumination is not visible to the naked human eye, even under the best of circumstances. Thus, this means that sunset on November the 25th will correspond to the end of the eighth biblical month known as Bull. And this will be the beginning of the first day of the ninth biblical month. Now, in regards to the beginning of the next biblical year, by looking at the metonic cycle, we can see that 2023 does not require a leap month in the spring. So, the next biblical year will begin when the 12th month of this current year ends. Therefore, Abib day number one will begin at sunset on March the 22nd, 2023, when the moon reaches 2.15% luminosity by sunset at 7.44 p.m. And since we know it was 30 A.D. when our Lord was crucified, buried, resurrected, and received into heaven, on the exact anniversary of our Lord's crucifixion, which is Abib the 14th, at sunset, on April the 4th of 2023, friends, it will have been exactly 1,993 solar years since those world-changing events. About this special day, God has said, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now, you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood, and put it on the two doorposts, and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. For this reason, we call Abib the tenth, Lamb Selection Day, and we choose Jesus for our Lamb, just as the people of Jerusalem did when they welcomed our Lord into their city with shouts of Hosanna and the waving of palm branches. Also, we call Abib the 14th Passover Preparation Day, because on the 14th the Lamb must be killed, and the houses of all God's people must be deleavened for the feast of unleavened bread. But Christ, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us once for all almost 2,000 years ago. And his blood opened the veil into the Holy of Holies, representing heaven itself, so no one comes to the Father without approaching through the blood of Jesus, his Son. Truly, this is what we commemorate each year at the Passover meal, and that meal begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 
And this year, the Feast of Unleavened Bread will begin at sunset on April the 5th of 2023. On that holy night, we will eat the Passover meal in remembrance of the Lord's sacrifice of his body and his blood, freely offered up to set us free from sin's slavery. Then, because the Feast of Unleavened Bread lasts for seven days, no leaven will be eaten or seen in our dwelling places until sunset on April the 12th. And this is a reminder to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness from our lives, since we publicly declared we died to sin when we were baptized into Christ Jesus our Lord. And because God said the first and the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread are high Sabbath days, from sunset on the 5th to sunset on the 6th of April, it will be a high Sabbath. Likewise, from sunset on the 11th to sunset on the 12th of April, it will be a high Sabbath. Meanwhile, the day after the weekly Sabbath that follows the 15th of Abib is the day of first fruits, as well as day number one in the count to 50 or Pentecost. And this year's first fruits will begin at sunset on April the 8th. After resting on the high Sabbath and the weekly Sabbath as God has commanded, on this day our sisters went to the tomb to tend to our Lord's body. And they found our Lord had risen from the dead as the first fruits of the resurrection. So each year we commemorate the Lord's victorious resurrection on the day of first fruits, and we remember their blessed discovery. Then, by counting out seven Sabbaths to the day after the seventh Sabbath, which is the same as counting out fifty days from the day of first fruits, we arrive at the day the apostles called. The 50th, which is transliterated from the Greek as Pentecost. Thus, on May 27th, at sundown, as the weekly Sabbath ends, the High Sabbath of Pentecost will begin. And on this day, we celebrate God fulfilling the new covenant promise of Jeremiah chapter 31, when the Holy Spirit came to write God's law on the hearts and minds of all who have been cleansed from their sins by the blood of Jesus our Messiah. Then, by tracking the passing months, we can know when the seventh month arrives, and on the night of the new moon that announces the seventh month, we celebrate the Day of Trumpets. This High Sabbath will begin this year, on September the 16th at sundown. And on this day we remember how God descended to Sinai at the sound of a trumpet, and soon he will descend to earth again when the last glorious trumpet sounds. When Jesus comes, he will cleanse the earth of all those who walk in unrighteousness, and he will then be at one with his church, on a cleansed and sanctified earth, as it becomes his dwelling place. So just as the high priest cleansed the tabernacle of God each year on the Day of Atonement, so the glory of God could reside among the children of Israel, Jesus, our high priest, will cleanse this earth so he can dwell with his church, and this high and solemn Sabbath will begin this year at sunset on September the 25th. But the whole point of the gospel and the annual feast cycle that proclaims the good news is that God has made a way for his people to be set free from sin's bondage, filled with his spirit, cleansed from all iniquity, so they can tabernacle with him forever and ever. Friends, the Feast of Tabernacles that ends the annual feast cycle each year it teaches us the purpose of the gospel and the destiny of God's people. 
We will one day be one with Jesus, just as Jesus is one with the Father and the Spirit. And we will tabernacle with God forevermore, with no more curse, no more sin, no more pain, no more death, and no more suffering. So this year, we will celebrate that glorious prophetic truth from sunset on September the 30th to sunset October the 7th. And sunset on September the 30th will welcome a high Sabbath, just as sunset on October the 8th will welcome the high Sabbath that closes out the Feast of Tabernacles as well as the entire annual feast cycle. By these feasts, we mark the passage of time each year until the Lord's return, and by his feasts we teach the world the true gospel of Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. <laughs>